गौरवाणी प्रचारिणी निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणी वाचाकल्पतरुभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So welcome all of you for today's program, and I'll speak on this topic of does religion cause war in four parts. We'll talk first about this argument itself. Then we'll talk about from the argument from the historical perspective. Then I will talk about it from the philosophical perspective, which the Bhagavad Gita gives. Then I'll talk about it from the applicational perspective at a social level, and finally application perspective. At an individual level. So now, if, if does religion cause war? If this were true, if religion would be causing war, logically this would imply two things: that non-religious regions of the world should have no violence. Religion were the cause of violence, and the religious regions of the world should constantly have violence. Now, the question that religion causes war does come because we have seen. some conflicts which go on in the name of religion but there's a tendency for over generalization now if you look at the history itself of the last century only so little politics is a book written by social historian rg romel and he said that if you compare non religious parts of the world and violence the biggest level at the at the governmental level where non religion was tried was marxism in china and soviet russia and without any war being fought the number of people in these two countries who were killed by the government themselves <laughs> were more than the number of people killed in the first world or second world war and all wars in the 20th century combined together so the number of victims of all wars were 35 million 700000 whereas the victims of marxist government were 95 million 200000 so here we see that why violence is cause equally if not more in non religious set, non religious settings also now if you consider religion and violence we'll see that more than 90% of the world's people are religious and in that if religion were the cause of violence and practically everybody should be fighting with everyone else at a physical level the world should be filled with wars but again we don't see that as the case so war is there and religion may be a contributing factor to it but the idea that religion causes war is basically a convenient way to scapegoat religion as the world became more and more multicultural we started having secularism and secularism originally meant freedom for religion which your faith you want to practice you practice that but increasingly secularism is being interpreted as not freedom for religion but freedom from religion so we don't want any religion we simply want atheism and for this school of thought or for this idea to propagate itself religion is made into a convenient scapegoat for causing violence or religion causes violence better let us have no religion but it is as i said it is not religion alone that causes violence let's see what it is that causes violence so we are talking about does religion cause war or cause violence so let's look at religion first of all the word religion itself is such a broad word that <coughs> considering it as a causal factor is sometimes unhelpful if you consider is all religion the same that we may have jihadi terrorists who kill children and who use children to kill children also there are teenagers who are made into suicide bombers and if they are what is called as religion and then we have also the amish you know a school shooter came and killed children in their school and those amish there is a movie called amish grace which describes how those amish went and forgave 
the shooter and they went and also offered condolences to the widow of that shooter and they offered support to them so now both of them are religion but the word religion is used in such a broad sense that classifying people simply as religious or non-religious is not very helpful in understanding how people will behave so the Bhagavad Gita offers us another classification that is the classification based on the three modes of material nature three modes are goodness, passion and ignorance Sattva Guna, Raja Guna and Tamma Guna so this is talked about throughout the Bhagavad Gita but especially in the 14th chapter Krishna talks about how these three modes shape everything that we do so for example <clears throat> right now we all observe things we respond to things how I see something and how you see something same thing will be different so the modes are subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and consciousness suppose people are in a crowded place say a movie theater and suddenly fire breaks out some people they just rush to the nearest exit and many times when some accident like this happens more than the casualties caused by the accident are the casualties caused by the panic the stampede that happens after the accident so some people just get petrified fire does not know what to do some people will look oh there is a fire there is a fire extinguisher and they will go to the fire extinguisher and they will extinguish the fire so the people in the mode of passion, which is what the majority of the people are, in the, the mode of passion is characterized by action before contemplation. It's want to act first. Oh, something has happened, I have to act immediately. Action before contemplation is the characteristic of passion. In the mode of goodness, it is contemplation first and action later. So, some people speak to express their thoughts. And some people speak to discover their thoughts. <laughs> they speak, ah, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> so what happens is action before contemplation. Speech comes before proper thought. That's the mode of passion. Mode of goodness is contemplation first, action later. In the mode of ignorance, there is neither action nor contemplation. Just petrified. It's just delusion. Ignorance. Mode of ignorance. So another way to understand is, some people make things happen as people in the mode of goodness okay, this is what to be done, this is what they, I'll do this, you do this and we'll make things happen some people watch things happen they start off one thing but they do it so impulsively that one thing goes wrong, second thing goes wrong third thing goes wrong, everything becomes a mess so some people make things happen some people watch things happen and some people wonder what happened <laughs> so that is the characteristic of the mode of ignorance so now the, these three are non-sectarian characterizations of human personalities, of human beings basically. So a person may be a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or an atheist or an agnostic. Uh, there will be people in these three categories. Goodness, passion, ignorance. These are basically we could say human typologies. And the Srimad Bhagavatam which is an ancient scripture which continues the wisdom given in the Bhagavad Gita explains that even bhakti can be performed in the three modes in goodness, passion and ignorance so, so how does this relate to our discussion on religion and war the point is that what we claim to believe doesn't define us as much as how we live what we claim to believe is our ideology but how we live is determined primarily by our mentality and ideology maybe I'm a religion, I'm a believer, I'm a non-believer. But there might be a person who is a non who is a believer, who, who, who is a theist, who believes in God, but that person might be in the mode of ignorance. And there might be a non-believer, an atheist, who might be in the mode of goodness. And usually, whenever <coughs> this idea is brought about that religion causes war. What happens is people focus on, zero in on, the behavior of religious people who are in the modes of passion and ignorance. 
And so the religious may, the non-religious may say, oh, religious people, just see what they have done here, what they have done there, what they have done there. Religious people are so bad. And conversely, religious people can also criticize the non-believers. Just see, there are non-believers also who can be in the mode of goodness, passion and ignorance. And when they are in non-believers and ignorance, they will also do terrible things. So, there are some Marxist thinkers who say that, actually Marxism was not responsible for the, <coughs> for the genocide that happened in Soviet Russia. It was actually the misapplication of Marxism by the leaders, Lenin and Stalin. So, that is one theory. But the point is that in whatever be one's ideology, one's mentality will shape how one acts. I may believe whatever I want or whatever I claim to believe. But how I act at a functional level will be determined by the modes that I am in. So broadly speaking, these three modes affect our behavior in three different ways. When we are in the mode of goodness, we are wisdom seekers. Is better now? Yeah. So, in the mode of goodness, wherever we are, whatever be our ideology, whatever be our we will be seeking wisdom. We will act in a way in which we can learn and understand. If we are in the mode of passion, our primary purpose is to seek power. Power may be political power, it may be physical power, or it may even be intellectual power. Some people discuss to understand what is right. Some people discuss to prove that they are right. So those who are in goodness, they will discuss to understand what is right. But those in passion, they will discuss somehow or the other, I want to prove that I am right. And when this happens, when people are in the a mode of passion, religious people can also be in the mode of passion. And the religion becomes a tool not so much for gaining wisdom, but for gaining power. And if power becomes the motive, then for pursuing power, one may do various unethical things, violent things, even atrocious things. Because power is the primary motive. And people who are in the mode of ignorance, they, say, they, can't, they can't do much. Neither action nor contemplation. So there's this delusion. So they are always seeking for scapegoats. Oh, that person is the cause of my misery. That social group is the cause of my misery. That religion is the cause of my misery. So, in the mode of ignorance, we do not want to do the hard work of trying to understand complex issues. So, we want to find quick explanations for complex problems. So, so for the religious people, they may say, oh, irreligion is the cause of all problems. And religious people may say, religion is the cause of all problems. It's not ideology alone. It's the mentality. I have a Muslim friend, and he told me that, I can communicate better with moderates of other traditions than fanatics of my own tradition, than extremists of my own tradition. So, extremists, so moderates, would fall broadly in the mode of goodness. They understand what they are practicing and they understand what others are practicing. At least they try to understand. So, communication is possible. But, the extremists, they are not, underst not interested in wisdom at all. Somehow I prove myself that I am right if they are in a mode of passion. Or they are just out to blame others. No matter what explanation is given, no, they blame, blame, blame. So most of the world is in a mode of passion going towards ignorance. And because of that, there are wars, there are conflicts, there is violence. And this is, this can be rationalized in many different ways. And one rationalization for the violence is, is religion. Religion can be very easily used to whip up people's emotions. But it is not religion alone. The emotions of people were whipped up by Hitler using, the, using Nazism, Nazism. And then a whole country started believing that we should rule the world and for that we should exterminate the Jews. So hatred can be fomented by, by any ideology and if people, the people for, Fomenting that have a particular mentality, they will use that ideology accordingly. So by ideology, I refer to once what one claims to believe. By mentality, I refer to how we function in life. 
Now, moving on. So here at till now what I talked about is that in goodness we will seek wisdom, in passion we will seek power, in ignorance we will seek scapegoats. So now, if we say, okay, this kind of people are then good in athi, athi, among believers also and non-believers also. So what is the difference then? What practical difference does religion make to anyone at all? So, yeah, actually, we will all be in different levels of modes, but religion, if understood properly, can become an agent for individual transformation, can become a force for individual transformation. Now, how does that happen? For that, let us compare. Yeah. So, spirituality is a higher dimensional science. This is in science, there is theory and experiment. Similarly, in spirituality, there is philosophy and there is religion. So, theory proposes, okay, this may be like this, this may be like this, this may be like this. So, and the experiment examines, is it really true? Newton proposed the law of gravity. Then we do experiments to check whether it is really true. Similarly, the theoretical branch of spirituality is philosophy. Philosophy gives postulates about the nature of reality. For example, the Bhagavad Gita begins by telling that there is an irreducible spark of consciousness within us. We at our core are souls. So the, uh, there is a supreme being. The purpose of life is for the finite soul to harmonize with the infinite soul. This is, these are, these are philosophical postulates. And then the religion is meant to be like the experiment in science. Religion is meant to have Involve practices that help us to experience what the philosophy is teaching. In the ninth chapter, the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Raj Vidya Raj Duryam, Avitram Idam Uttamam, Pratyakshavagamam Dharmyam, Susukham Kartam Avyayam. He says that Raj Vidya Raj Duryam is the king of knowledge. He's talking about the philosophy aspect. But then it says, also says, Pratyakshavagamam Dharmyam, Pratyakshavagamam. One will experience this. So, the process of philosophy, the philosophy tells us we are not the body, we are the soul. The religion, for example, involving the chanting of the holy names, that is a process by which we can raise our consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level. And by that we can experience the reality of what the philosophy is teaching. Another example could be like a mountain. A, the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness. The bottom of the mountain is material consciousness. And the process of religion is meant to take us up from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. And from the bottom of the mountain there may be different paths, different trails of the mountain. So those different trails are like different religions. The purpose of the religions is to raise one's consciousness to the spiritual level. Spirituality can trans... So the philosophy tells us, okay, there is a better place, there is a better way to live at the top of the mountain. Spiritual consciousness is what we should try to achieve. And religion gives us the process by which we can do that. And when philosophy and religion are both together, then it becomes a potent force for inner transformation. However, many times, one of these limbs gets amputated. So Srila Prabhupada says that philosophy without religion is just mental speculation. That means if I just theorize, oh it may be like this, it may be like that, it may be like that, and I don't practice anything, then the result is, I, I may say, oh maybe there's a top of the mountain over there, maybe it is like that over there, maybe it is like that over there, but I never go up the mountain, then I will never know what is there, it's just my imagination or my speculation. We want uh, experience in a transformation. So say two armchair speculators might discuss, you know, maybe God exists. There's so much design in the world. Uh, no, maybe God doesn't exist. Uh, there's so much suffering in this world. Anyway, there's this bottle of alcohol in me, in front of me. The pleasure in it exists. Let me just drink it. So what happens? All that philosophy it doesn't lead to any practical transformation or liberation of consciousness. So, so philosophy without any practice is just mental speculation. It's just different propositions offered by different people with no opportunity or avenue 
for either confirming or disproving anything. And Srila Prabhupada was in New York once, after a talk, uh, one young hippie asked Prabhupada, Swamiji, your philosophy sounds like that of the Buddha. So, Prabhupada said, do you follow Buddha? No. Prabhupada said, follow Buddha, follow Jesus, follow Krishna, follow someone. Don't just talk. <laughs> Don't just talk. There is blind faith and there is reasonable faith. Blind faith is we just, anybody tells us anything and we start following it. Reasonable faith is sensible and verifiable. When I go to a doctor, I have to put faith when the doctor prescribes something. But before putting faith, I evaluate. If I have stomach pain and the doctor tells me we have to do a surgery to cut off your leg. Says, what? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. But the doctor says, okay, you've got some indigestion in your stomach. Uh, and this acidity is there because of that. Okay, that makes sense. So we evaluate whether what the doctor says makes sense or not. That's sensible part. And the doctor says, okay, take this medicine for a few days, you'll get cured. That's the verifiable part. I take it for a week and see if I'm cured or not. So similarly, spirituality calls for reasonable faith. The sensible, how philosophy is sensible, how spirituality is sensible is explained by the philosophy. So if you study the philosophy, at the end of it, Krishna doesn't call for faith. Krishna calls for deliberation. Vimrish, Shaita, Dashe, Shena. Deliberate and then do as you desire. So the Bhagavad Gita is not so much a book of commandments as it is a book of choices. You do this, this will happen. You do this, this will happen. Now you decide what you want to do. So then, the second part of reasonable faith is very fine. We take medicine. So religion is like the practice which is meant to help us become elevated. So if I just go to 100 doctors and hear from them, this is the problem, this is the problem, but I don't practice anything. I don't take any medicine, it won't benefit me much. Similarly, if we have religion without philosophy, then that is either sentimentalism or fanaticism. Religion is, oh, if this feels good to me, so I do it. And whatever it feels like doing, one may do that. So then, religion becomes mostly a pious form of entertainment. Religion becomes a pious form of entertainment. Uh, I am based in Mumbai, Maharashtra. So in Maharashtra, there is a, often a big festival of Ganesh. So Ganesh is one of the devtas. And when I, I was invited once to speak on the Bhagavad Gita. So I went to, went to the Ganesh Utsav. And there they were having, there was a... a there's a deity of Ganesh and they were having Bollywood movie songs going on. Right next to, in the loudspeaker that was next to Ganesh. Then I asked them that, you know, why don't you have some bhajans about Ganesh? He says, no. He says, Ganesh is Bhakta Vatsala. He loves his devotees. So whatever his devotees love, he loves that. <laughs> <laughs> now this is the perverse logic. <laughs> we don't use God as a tool to just rationalize our entertainment. So, we actually for us, God is a main, not to entertain men, but to enlighten men. So, it's sentimental means whatever feels good, I will do that and that becomes religion. Or it can become fanaticism. Fanaticism means, my way is the only way. So, going back, there are some religions which have statements. This is the, you should follow, this is the only way to God. Now, these statements have a context and a purpose. <clears throat> if a patient has gone to a doctor and doctors are saying, okay, take this medicine, but the patient says, you know, oh, I went to this doctor and this doctor said this, and I went to that doctor and he said that, I went to that doctor and she said that. And the doctor will say, just forget what other doctors have told me, just told you, just do what I am telling you, you will be cured. Now when the doctor is saying, just forget what other doctors have told, just do what I am saying, that doesn't mean the doctor is saying all other doctors are wrong. The point is, this statement is to create focus. Similarly, in every religious traditions, there are statements, just follow this. They are not meant to reject other parts. They are meant to create a focus. But some people who want to use religion as a means to gain power, they will say this is an absolute statement and everybody else is wrong. So some people say that if you don't follow my religion, you are going to go to hell. And there are some extremists who say, not only are you going to go to hell, we will help you get there faster. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So this is philosophy. This is religion without any philosophy. It can become sentimental or fanatical. But when philosophy and religion both come together, then they can become a very powerful tool for transformation. As I said earlier, in the mode of goodness, we seek wisdom. So we need to, when you practice religion, the focus needs to change. We focus on practicing religion not to prove but to improve. Not to prove that I am right and you are wrong, but to improve myself. To become a better person. So if we practice religion with this purpose, religion can raise our consciousness up. So if we come to the mode of goodness, then we'll be seeking wisdom. Okay, how can I live better? How can I become a better human being? How can I become a more spiritual person? So as people in the mode of passion will use religion to prove that they are right. And for that there will be intellectual polemics, there will be physical confrontations, there will be political wars. All these will come as long as the consciousness is in the mode of passion. But if somebody practices religion diligently, they will rise from the lower modes, from ignorance or passion to goodness and thus they will become agents of positive change. They will promote understanding, self-understanding and social understanding. So if we focus more on inwards, using religion as a means to improve rather than prove, then religion can actually raise our consciousness and decrease conflicts. Now, I'll conclude with one last theme of the Bhagavad Gita itself talks about war. So, <clears throat> it does, is violence always evil? The Bhagavad Gita is spoken in battlefield where uh, after the Gita is spoken, war happens. Some people say, this is Bhagavad Gita calling for war. So first of all, violence is bad, but it is not always evil. Sometimes in some places when violence is there, the United Nations may send a peacekeeping force. A force means what? Aggression, violence. So to prevent violence, sometimes we may have to do violence. Isn't it? So violence itself it is not good, but it is sometimes necessary. In the real world, it is just unavoidable. There are some religions which say that, oh, we should never be violent. Uh, Non-violence is the supreme religion, supreme to value. But then when the followers of this religion, they want to protest against something which is going wrong, they immolate themselves. I mean, they're immolating themselves, they're burning themselves, what are they doing? They're doing violence to their own bodies. So, okay, you're not doing violence to others, but you're doing violence to ourselves. So, sometimes there are situations in the world where opposition has to be made. And sometimes the opposition may require as assertiveness or even aggressiveness. The Bhagavad Gita is uh, spoken in such a setting. So, does the Gita call for war? Not exactly. The Gita is a part of the Mahabharata and the Mahabharata prior to that describes how many atrocities the, the good people in the Mahabharata, the Pandavas suffered at the hands of, hands of the bad people, the Kauravas. So they were tried to be burnt alive, they tried to be poisoned, the Pandavas wife was publicly attempted to be disrobed, they were maligned, they were discriminated against. And one after another, everything the Pandavas tolerated. But at a particular point, tolerance becomes importance. Tolerance becomes a license to atrocity rather than becoming a tool for peace. So after they were, they were dispossessed of their kingdom by unfair means, they were exiled, they did it all and when they came back and they asked for their side of, side of the kingdom, their part of the kingdom, the Kauravas were remorseless. Sometimes we say, I have done everything humanly possible. The Pandavas did everything humanly possible and everything divinely possible. Also. To try to get peace, the Pandavas were ready to settle with only just five king, five villages. They were the rulers of a huge kingdom. But they were ready to just give us five villages. And Krishna himself went as the peace messenger. Krishna was the most powerful of all powerful warriors. Say so there is a war between India and Pakistan. Uh, and suppose the Indian Prime Minister goes to seek peace. Goes to Pakistan to petition for peace. And Pakistan, instead of accepting the petition, tries to arrest the Indian Prime Minister itself. It would be outrageous. That's what the Kauravas tried to do. Krishna himself went. 
they are try to arrest Krishna. So the Pandavas said that we will not give you enough. Kauravas said rather, we will not give you enough land even to put the tip of a needle through. Now there is a way of saying no, which is in a say no to a particular request but not no to a person. Like if somebody invites us for a program, as we invite uh, some, we invite someone for a program and they say yeah I would like to come but you know I got this engagement so I can't come. So they are saying no, but they are saying it's not a no to a person. But somebody says, you know, even if I die, my corpse will not come to your program. <laughs> <laughs> that is saying no, not just to the request, but to the person. Like banging the door in the face of someone. So that's what the Kauravas did. When they tried to, then they said that we will not give you enough land even to give that place a tip of a needle. So at that time, Krishna said, war is inevitable. The Bhagavad Gita's war was fought not to seek revenge or even seek power or property. It was sought to establish, fought to establish virtue, the rule of virtue. People who could, people who were ready to uh, disrobe a woman publicly, poison their own opponents, if they got understood that power, they could have wreaked havoc. So to curb them was essential for social harmony. This was the context of the Gita. More than that, if you look at the content of the Gita, uh, although the Gita is spoken just before a war occurs, within the Gita there is no war rhetoric, there is no war strategy. You, know, you should attack the enemy like this, you should do like this. There is no hate speech. Oh, those people are so bad, you should kill them. In fact, Krishna tells Arjuna, you should fight, but fight without any attachment and without any animosity. You should fight Nirvai Raha Sarva Bhute issue in 11.55 in the Bhagavad Gita says fight without having animosity towards anyone. The purpose was not to attack anyone or kill anyone. The purpose was to create social harmony. And even if you look at the conclusion of the Gita, at the end Krishna uh, completes the Gita and what does Arjuna say? Arjuna doesn't say I will fight. He says Karishi Vachnaptava. I will do your will. So the essential message of the Gita is that we should harmonize with God. In that specific context, harmonizing with God meant Arjuna had to fight a war. But that is not the universal application. In fact, if you look at the Gita, there are many traditional commentators on the Gita who have written. The Gita is a book we cherish for thousands of years. If you look at Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya, even Shankaracharya. They have written commentaries and none of the commentaries talk, call their followers, come on, you are fight against his religion. No, they are all talking about inner transformation. So the Gita is a book not about violence or silence. Its essential message is transcendence. We learn to raise our consciousness upwards from the material level to the spiritual level. And for that purpose, the Gita's message offers us both philosophy and religion. So to the extent we understand spirituality as a force for social trans for individual transformation. To that extent, we will find contentment internally. Because we'll transcend the worldly desires and cravings that cause conflict. And we will become agents of peace externally. So I'll summarize. I spoke today about does religion cause war? If religion were causing war, then religious Country places would always be violent and religious places would have no violence. But we saw religious places had more violence uh, than anywhere else in the whole world, Marxist countries. Then I talked about what causes violence actually. That is, religion is simply a scapegoat used by those who want to change secularism from freedom of religion to freedom from religion. And at the belief, our actions are determined not so much by our ideology but our mentality, not what we claim to believe but how we live. And how we live is shaped by the modes. Goodness, passion and ignorance. In goodness, we will seek wisdom. In passion, we will seek power. In ignorance, we will seek scapegoats. And whatever our ideology, we will use it for these purposes. So religion, if people are in the mode of passion, will use it. they will use it for seeking power and they may do violence for that purpose. And the Bhagavad Gita gives us spiritual knowledge by which we can rise from the lower modes to the higher modes. So spirituality is a force for inner transformation. Just like in science there is theory and experiment. In spirituality there is philosophy and religion. So philosophy without religion is just mental speculation. It's like we analyzing, a patient analyzing different treatments without taking anything. There's no benefit. 
And religion without philosophy is sentimentalism or fanaticism. It either becomes a pious entertainment or it becomes my way is the only way. It's like a patient considering that this doctor is only doctor and all other doctors are false. But ideally, philosophy and religion are meant to take us from the bottom of the mountain, which is material consciousness, to the top of the mountain, which is spiritual consciousness. And if we practice, understand philosophy and practice religion properly, then we can rise from the lower modes to the higher modes and thus we can become agent, we can find peace internally at the spiritual level and we can become agents of peace externally. The Bhagavad Gita doesn't call for violence. It, it calls for transcendence. In its particular setting, the context was that innumerable atrocities were performed. The, the antagonists were remorseless. And everything humanly and divinely possible was done to avoid war. But when it was unavoidable, it was what was done not in a vengeful mood, but for the mood of establishing social order. So the Gita's essential message is not of violence or silence, but of transcendence. Thank you very much. Side and questions from the gentleman's side. Okay, so we have a hand up on the lady's side. First, we'll start there. Please pass the mic. Thank you, Shabbat Thank you for your comments. Um, I'd like to ask when we're confronted in our own community or uh, with him, people maybe, you know, the, the point you made of using power or when someone's in the mode of passion, they use religion for their own mm -hmm. power or um, position, or even um, it, it's not necessarily a spiritual point that we use religion for mm -hmm. um, in service. Sometimes I find that that's woven into every tradition, and in our own tradition, if we, if we face that personally, or people that we know have confronted that, either by senior persons in the movement. I'd love to know your opinion on how do we, as an individual, as trying to practice and um, kind of be humble in our practice, uh, process and um, maybe respond to something yeah. that we feel is not appropriately used. I mean, and more we might see other people being not justly, correctly you know treated yeah. um it's a it's a very kind of subtle kind of knowing how to respond when I understand, you're yeah. so if we see in our own community some people uh, you being power seekers in the name of spirituality so how do we respond to them broadly speaking whenever we face any unpalatable or unpleasant situation we have three alternatives i put this as Tolerate, mitigate, or immigrate. <laughs> so if I find that the weather is very cold in a particular place, either I learn to tolerate it, or I get a lot of warm clothes, ensure that heating is there everywhere I go, mitigate it, or I emigrate, go to some other place. So similarly, when we find something which is going wrong in our community, then we have to see what is our position, what is our role, what is the influence that we have. Sometimes, some things may be small. Everybody has some limitations, everybody has some weaknesses. And we may decide that this is not such a big thing. Tolerance simply means to keep small things small so that we can focus on big things. So, <clears throat> when I see it that way, okay, this, this person has this problem, but then somebody else may come and that person may also have some problem. Everybody has, we all, none of us is perfect. So we may decide it can be tolerated. Uh, if it is a small thing. And otherwise, we may decide, I want to mitigate it. I want to do something to deal with it. And we can do it in a proper, respectful way. Talk with, uh, talk with uh, the concerned authorities or those who are senior to the concerned authorities. Sometimes we may be perceiving something as just the abuse of power. But, some, but we live in a real world. And that means there are limited resources, limited time. And those who are in leadership position have to take decisions. This is where we are going to invest our time, energy. That may not be abuse of power, it might just be like some people do not get facilities, there's no discrimination, it's just we have to prioritize it. So we sometimes if we just what happens sometimes when we see something wrong, we talk 
about others instead of talking with others. You know, oh, he did like that. Oh, he did like that. And I'm talking with A. A feels B has done something wrong, but instead of going and talking with B, A talks with C, C talks with D, D talks with E. And it just becomes an atmosphere of negativity. So talk with people instead of talk about people. And sometimes, uh, if we communicate our concerns properly, things can get clarified and rectified also. And sometimes some people may just be uh, too fixed in their way of doing things. And if we find it unbearable, then we immigrate. Immigrate doesn't necessarily mean we have to relocate somewhere else. Rather, we have to focus our energy on something else, focus our attention on something else. There are so many things wrong in the world and Krishna's movement is also a part of the world. So there will be so many things wrong here also. So we have to focus on how I can be an agent of positive change. So if I, if I focus on doing a particular service and I do it well, then we are setting a positive example and we will be creating change. It is easy uh, to curse the darkness, but it is much more effective to light a candle. Okay, answer your question. Yes. Go ahead. Dr. you very good, a very nice lecture, you know. Uh, you explain uh, that uh, purpose of, central purpose of Gita is to translate, transcend from material conscious to the spiritual conscious. Could you throw a little bit light on what the process is and what the spiritual conscious look like? Okay. So what is the process from going from material to spiritual consciousness and what does spiritual consciousness look like? The Bhagavad Gita describes in the 12th chapter as well as in several other places how those in spiritual consciousness are Advesta, Sarva Bhutana, Maitra, Karuna, Evacha, Nirmamo, Nirahankara So not envious of anyone, the beneficials of everyone, non-possessive, satisfied, selfless, diligent in uh, serving Krishna and serving others in relationship with Krishna. So there are virtues which can be universally seen as laudable, which are seen in spiritual people. And the Bhagavad Gita says this is the characteristic of one who is spiritual. And broadly speaking, Shri Prabhupada defines spiritual means one who seeks happiness internally. And material means one who seeks happiness externally. So internally means we connect with Krishna in our hearts. And in that connection we get satisfaction. Then we want to share that connection with others, so we will act externally also. But we are not dependent on the externals for our satisfaction. So spiritualists, they are characterized by inner satisfaction. And the, will, and the zeal to share that inner satisfaction with others. And the process of Bhakti Yoga is the recommended process in the Gita for raising oneself from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness. So it involves one aspect of studying scriptures. The Bhagavad Gita says that those who study the Gita, they are worshipping Krishna with their intelligence. It's like we may do Aarti with a lamb. We can do Aarti to Krishna with our intelligence, if we diligently study the Gita. So, <clears throat> we generally put it as the process for raising to spiritual consciousness, A, B, C, D. A is association of devotees. We come to temple, we come to programs. B is books, we read Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures. C is chanting the holy names. Chanting is like an elevator for our consciousness, by which we can rise upwards. And D is deity worship. We offer food, offer food to the deities and take their prasad and we worship the deities and make the Lord the center of our heart and the center of our home. That way we can spiritualize ourselves. Thank you. Any other questions? social harmony and trying to bring it back to the individuals in terms of behaviors mm -hmm. and thinking about the four regulated principles and I'm just wondering what you have to say in terms of how you could relate the individual four regulated principles towards the communal social harmony aspect. You could say something about that as okay. well. 
So how does the factors of the four regular principles uh, help in promoting social harmony? Yeah. So basically, if you consider no meat eating, now it's if you consider society as not just humanity but the whole of living world, no meat eating means we decrease violence against animals substantially. Now, gambling and intoxication, these are often the cause of disruption, violence, people drive drunk, there is people when they are drunk they attack each other. Most of domestic violence happens after people are intoxicated. And a lot of breakdown happens because of illicit affairs. So if we, these are principles, these are broadly speaking, the four regulatory principles bring us to the mode of goodness. And to the extent we are in goodness, to the extent, even if there are conflicts, we will, re we will resolve them in, uh, in amicable ways, not in aggressive or violent ways. So these are four regulatory principles help us to come to the mode of goodness and thus they promote harmony. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. They can, just, they can speak, I'll repeat the question. So, I just wanted to follow up on the first question where she was talking, uh, uh, you know, talking about, um, you know, how to make the judgment call of mm -hmm. when to stand up. Love your response. Um, uh, tolerate. Uh, mitigate or mitigate. mitigate. And so the Pandavas had done those three things. Oh, yeah. And that's what their story is. Exactly. And so you see one of the big struggles as a devotee is when do you actually take that decision? Now it's time for action. Do you have your your set of, uh, you know, what those okay. cues would be when to stand up and say, okay, now it's time for action versus okay. Okay. Yeah. So when do we decide, how do we decide when to tolerate or mitigate or migrate, when to just talk, take a stand? Broadly speaking, it is purpose that provides perspective. Say, so if we are, if I, if I'm going out of this room, if I have to go for another engagement, another program, if somebody wants to talk with me, I'll talk with him for a couple of minutes and I'll move on. If I don't have any other engagement, I'll wait and talk. So how do I decide how long I, how much time I spend on talking with someone? That is depend on my purpose. So Shri Prabhupada explains in the tenth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita purport that intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective. So what is of central importance, what is of peripheral significance. So that capacity is largely determined by purpose. So if I if I have a particular role in the community, if I have a particular service, then I focus on doing that service. And generally in the mode of, with the three modes of material nature, they also shape our conception of what we can do. In the mode of ignorance, we underestimate our capacity to control, capacity to change things. So, generally people in the mode of ignorance, whenever there are problems, they just feel sorry for themselves. Oh, you know, people are so bad, the world is so bad, everything is so bad. They get into, you can call a pity party. <laughs> when people in the mode of passion, they overestimate their capacity to change things. You go over any problem, I mean, I'll fix the problem. And many times, our reaction to a problem becomes a bigger problem than the problem itself. So, <clears throat> in the mode of passion, we overestimate the capacity. In the mode of goodness, we are able to estimate properly. Okay, this is what I can do. This is, this is what how much area I have control over. This is what I don't have control over. So generally, if we feel there is an issue which needs to be addressed, it is good that we try to get ourselves to the mode of goodness. So generally, by praying, by chanting, by studying scriptures, when we come to a reflective mode, at that time we can analyze. Okay, how important is this? How much capacity do I have to change this? And <clears throat> then we can take a decision. So generally, if I have a particular service, the, all of us should have a well-defined service for Krishna. And that is our contribution to Krishna. And then in the light of that service, we will decide. Okay, this is important, this is not that important. Shila Prabhupada says, how do we define Krishna consciousness? 
So if you come to the temple and if you look at the deities and if you feel that Krishna is asking me, what are you doing for me? Then you are Krishna conscious. Most people come to the temple and ask Krishna, what are you doing for me? <laughs> so, to conclude this answer, suppose I am going by a train. And it's a, in, Mumbai, in Mumbai, we have crowded trains, the train's capacity is 50, there are 500 people in it. So then people are squeezed together. And say somebody starts pushing me. And some people just want to show their work. Now, I will say, I'll push you back. And they push me back, I push them back. And we get so caught into pushing each other, that my station comes and goes and I'm still pushing. <laughs> <laughs> so then I will just decide, okay, I'm here temporarily. And this person wants more space, let me just move somewhere aside. So my purpose is not to occupy that space. I just tolerate it at that time. But if that person starts pushing me out of the train only, <laughs> then I'll have to take a stand. I can't let them push. <laughs> so similarly, if we keep this purpose in purpose in perspective, if we keep the purpose in the forefront of our consciousness, we will get the perspective of which issues are worth fighting and which issues are worth tolerating. Okay, how do I co how do I correlate that with Arjuna? Basically, Arjuna decided to fight uh, after the, a particular line was breached when Draupadi was dishonored. For all practical purposes, at that time war became inevitable. But still the Pandavas tried to avoid it. And still they sought peace. But if a person doesn't even acknowledge one's mistakes, or to speak of repenting one's mistakes, uh, Duradhana, when the peace negotiations were going on at that time, says, after great introspection, I don't see any fault in what I've done. So for such a person, <laughs> so for such a person, there was no way that he could reform. So at that time, action was required because that was the only way the person, uh, the things could be brought back to dharmic level. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, we we're just going. To, we have to stop. We're going to have to stop here. But um, I'm hoping you have some time to sure. sit at the sure, book area because yeah. he has um, Chaitanya Charanpa with some books that he's traveling with and invites you to. And they're set up at our uh, Wisdom Corner. We have some chairs there as well and hopefully perhaps you can sit for a while sure. if people have questions. So um, that's something you can consider. You can get a plate and then you can go sit there and continue the conversation. He is speaking this evening up in Baltimore. So he can't stay with us all day, but we'll try to get him to stay here. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. For coming to you. He's so expert at giving great definitions. Did you notice that? And he'll say things and like, yes, that's exactly right. So please listen. All our all our uh, talks are recorded and uploaded on SoundCloud, uh, usually by the end of day today or certainly by tomorrow, so please listen in again.